Okay, turn in your Bibles to Romans, the 14th chapter. In the 14th verse we start today, Romans 14. I know and am persuaded that by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth or judgeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing unclean of itself but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. We read again, we want you to notice carefully what that says. Verse 15, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat of whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and the things wherewith one may edify another. For the meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, or anything rather by brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith, have it thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, of whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All right, we've read you this passage this morning because it deals with the conscience. So much of it is dealing with the conscience before God. Now, conscience is based upon, of course, knowledge, information, culture, genetics, child training, and decisions. The conscience is made up of these things to receive its information. But here, somebody's conscience is not properly organized with God's grace. Perhaps some of them were new believers. Perhaps others were indeed Christians who were brought up under legalistic parents. Perhaps others had a legalistic pulpit. Perhaps others had a particular training that was difficult for them because they were condemned. There's a lot of reasons that lead to a troubled conscience. And therefore, some of these folks could not eat this meat that was offered to those idols. And therefore, they were very offended if anyone said it was all right. Now, there is a teaching today which considers your liberty is your liberty at any cost. Your liberty is your liberty at any cost. And a lot of people have the liberty to express their freedom at the expense of offending others who fall into some of the earlier categories that we have just mentioned. Liberty 
which says everything's all right. When we were going along fine back in the early 80s, I had an old friend ask me if he could come and speak. He, he was actually the president and founder of a college where I was appointed field secretary of all the churches. There were 67 churches from here to uh, northeast part of the United States. Because our church was prospering and had over a thousand people out, he appointed me to be field secretary. Basically, that was why. And at that time, he was very fundamental. Uh, in fact, he, he preached a lot on liberty, but he still believed in the Bible as the Word of God. However, unfortunately, as time went on, he expressed a witch hunt against anybody that had any kind of a standard. And he got more and more neutralized pertaining to compromise. Well, as time went on, the college appeared to be going good. It had a well acceptance with all diverse denominations. It was not in any way uh, criticized or persecuted. But because he was brought up in a right-wing fundamentalist camp, and because he fought hard at the IFCA meetings, and he was a very sharp person, and he fought very hard at these IFCA meetings to make it balanced, and when the IFCA leaders, for you folks that don't know what the IFCA is, is Independent Fundamental Churches of America. Independent Fundamental Churches of America. I used to be a member of the IFCA. And it was extremely conservative, which was, that part was good. But it was far to the right without much grace or liberty toward anyone. Well... He fought in the fundamentalist movement and lost. His defeat brought him into a reaction and resentment. I'm sure he doesn't know that and probably doesn't understand that. But he started to preach, and he was very gifted, very smart, very bright, graduated from college with high honors of his class. But he started constantly to crusade against standards against anything that had any depth to it pertaining to conviction of standards. He was sort of unintentionally, perhaps, but getting even. So what happened? The school started to deteriorate. After a process of deterioration, at the graduation of a senior class, they all went to a bar room and celebrated. And there was all kinds of unhealthy relationships with lust going on throughout the entire college. All kinds of drinking, and it was never rebuked. I, by that time, I was out of there and wasn't a part of it. Then he asked me, although I wasn't associated with him, could he come to speak to our church? And he'd been a good friend, and I, I thought, well... It isn't going to do any harm to let him speak because what's he going to say that could hurt anything in one message? But unfortunately, he preached two or three messages on two or three occasions, and it did hurt tremendously. He made such statements as, it's time that we understood what taking up your cross means. It means to pluck corn on people's Sabbath, he said, and it meant if you wanted to drink in front of people, drink in front of people, let them grow up and uh, smoke your pipe, whatever you wanted to do, he said. Well, after he left, <clears throat> I didn't know it, apparently was somewhat naive, but some of the staff members started in some very bad habits. Those bad hab habits in the next two years led to reaction, rebellion, and... Uh, not honoring anything, talking behind everybody's back, all because this, per this person had brought in this leaven. 
Well, of course, the lesson I had to learn was why did I let him in? On the other hand, uh, why would they <clears throat> fall when they were seasoned in doctrine just because of what a speaker said in the pulpit? Maybe it was good that he came in because it tested their decision-making process. So he started believing that you ought to do things to pluck con on weaker brother's life, on the weaker sister's life. And that's what he did, pluck con. He called it plucking con. I called it offending. Now, in 1 Corinthians 8, so of course since then, he's never spoken in our pulpit. We have long since broken our fellowship. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 8. <clears throat> When you sin against a weaker brother for whom Christ died, you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. You sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, no less my brother to offend, lest I make my brother to offend. So there it is. <clears throat> There's the word of God on the doctrine of not offending a weaker brother. <clears throat> Paul said, as long as the world stands, see, as long as the world stands, I will not do anything to offend my weaker brother. Now, the plucking con principle comes differently. The plucking con principle comes against self-righteous people that live in their self-righteous robes, holier than thou, as Isaiah the prophet teaches. And plucking con against self-righteous people is quite another thing. But offending a weaker brother and we, we gave you, at the beginning of Romans 14, the doctrine of a weaker brother. We gave you the doctrine of a stronger brother. And it all coincides as the premise for this class. Having that premise, we can uh, speak freely about this particular verse. So, it is so important not to do anything to offend a weaker brother. Because if we offend a weaker brother, we offend Christ, the Bible says. On the other hand, and we're not dealing with immorality or biblical transgressions when we say this, of course, and you know we're not. There are many things that by themselves to the believer who has faith, there are many things that are not unclean. So pertaining to these areas, the 14th verse says, but to him that esteemeth or judgeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But he said, I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. So there isn't a single thing unclean by itself, that, that isn't defined as sin by the Word of God. If it's defined as sin, of course it's unclean. Now, every believer in Ezekiel 44, 23 and 24, should be able to judge between the clean and the unclean, between the holy and the common. And it's very important to be able to make a judgment pertaining to the clean and the unclean, the holy and the common. Now, when we deal with the clean and the unclean, it isn't just external things. It is dealing with conversation, communication. It is dealing with several things that deal with the heart. In other words, the whole issue here is having a godly conscience and not a conditional conscience. The weaker brother here had a conditional conscience or a conscience that had been conditioned. 
either by a legalistic pulpit or by being a new believer or by being legislated to in training or having a very legalistic education from the standpoint of discipline, perhaps overly legalistic. And uh, so whatever caused this conscience to be conditioned, it was a conditioned conscience. Now, it is obvious that scores of people have some aspect to this principle of a conditioned conscience. A conditioned conscience and not a free conscience with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus Christ. It's very interesting because I must understand it and be very loving and very patient and very compassionate and very careful because you, uh, certain people have such a conditioned conscience that they cannot take any kind of humor. It's very obvious. And while they're kind and they don't verbally react, they do not see the funny side of anything. Now, there must be a reason for that. I, uh, sometimes I think it's good to pluck con on their Sabbath. But I certainly wouldn't want to do it to be very, to be offensive. Now, what areas would you have a conditional conscience on? Probably most people have a conditional conscience on their appearance. Now, who's that, who's that comedian? I haven't heard him for, for five years. I heard him on a Sunday afternoon with Larry King once and five years ago. What's his name, that Jewish guy, very popular guy? What's his name? Oh, you can help me out. What? Yes. Very good. Who said that? That's right, Sandy. Don Rickles. Now, that, that guy would pluck corn on your Sabbath. <laughs> he doesn't care what your Sabbath is, either. <laughs> yeah, yes, he, he is different. The reason I brought it up was, I, I, oh, 15, yeah, 15, 18 years ago, I went to where he was having one of his things, and I walked out within 10 minutes. I, I'd never been, so I thought, well, we're here with the relatives, let's go to it. And we went in and we were seated there and uh, I think Loretta Lynn was going to be there and Eddie Arnold and this Don Rickles. But we never did get to see the rest of them. The funny part of it is he, he was so good that even though you, it was very distasteful, the reason I couldn't stay is I would have been laughing at the wrong things. <laughs> And so I got up and walked out in front of everybody. But um, at least I had sense enough to do that. I had, didn't have sense enough not to go, but I had sense <laughs> enough to walk out anyway. And uh, there was this Italian lady down to the left right near him. And you know, if you've ever heard him, you know what he's like. And he called her. He said, you're so big, fat, ugly, and homely, and you smell so. I wish I hadn't come tonight. <laughs> that was his opening. Now, the sad part of it was, she was all of those things. Now, <laughs> if you make a joke and it isn't true, it, isn't, it can be taken. But goodness sake, I, I was a little bit behind her, and she was everything he <laughs> said. That, that's, what, that's, that's what bothered me. And I don't believe it, laughing and anything about people's person, persons or, or appearance, but what are you going to do? We can't stop it when, when he does it and has that Jewish face on. And, you know, and then he told those jokes that Bryant Williams modernizes and redeems and makes civil, I would say, you know. Like when he came home as a little baby, he was so ugly the landlord kicked his mother out. <laughs> 
and his father separated and got divorced because he looks, the baby looks so ugly. <laughs> Those kind of jokes. But, uh, uh, boy, he, he was offending people. He offended all the races, nationalities, you name it. He was, see, I suppose he could get away with it in terms of comedy because he attacks himself. I guess that's how a fellow like him gets away with it, and they don't get him for being a racist and all that. But he was saying everything under the sun. But in the, in the 10 minutes, I, I did leave exactly in 10 minutes, but you can get a lot in 10 minutes. <laughs> But the Christian must not. I told him to go to England. England would like it over there in England, over in London. But uh, there's nothing, that's, that was unclean, by the way, period. But there are many things that are not unclean that people call clean. Uh, People call unclean when they're clean because they, they have a conditioned or a conditional conscience. Now, you know, I think that's why a lot of people can't enter into the finished work experience of their position. The finished work experience of their position is because their conscience is so conditioned to think that they're not acceptable because they're maybe overweight, and overweight has, some people look very good to be um, somewhat heavy, and I mean, but some people reject themselves because they're overweight. Other people reject themselves because they were picked upon when they were younger and certain things about their life, and they reject themselves. And other people reject themselves because the father called them stupid so many times when they were being uh, taught and growing up in the home. And... Uh, they couldn't get good friends or any friends at all sometimes in school. And these things all contributed to a conditional conscience. So when they hear the finished work, they can't really believe that Jesus Christ loves them or Jesus Christ could accept them because they have a conditional conscience. And uh, that's so important. Don't be vulnerable by accepting for years and years, a conscience that now has been conditioned. Uh, some people are wise guys because they use it for defense, because they're insecure. So the way to get over it is just always be the head of the party, just be wise and sarcastic to people to cover up their insecurity. And their conscience is conditioned. It's a beautiful thing not only not to have a conditional conscience, but, and I'm, I'm putting this in a different context today, but not to have a conscience of convenience. A conscience of convenience, perhaps, goes somewhat like this. If the world, some people, I preached this at a youth meeting many years ago, some people are run by the world. The world influences them and runs them, controls them. Other people uh, go along with everything the world does. And other people resist the world because they have a conscience that refuses to be a conscience of convenience. Some people cannot stand up against strong personalities. They just cannot stand up against strong personalities. That's why you have conspiracies in churches, conspiracies in organizations. They cannot stand up against strong personalities. They, they are taken in and victimized, and they have a conscience of convenience. So do not have a conscience of convenience. I, I gave that illustration about consequential conscience, and I think a consequential conscience is something that should be thoroughly thought of today. Uh, I said this because it's happened now to me three times in the past 17 days. Now think of it, in 17 days, I have received three telephone calls from people Perhaps they're 21, perhaps they're 22, I do not know. 
in there, around there, and in each case they have said to me, I'm pregnant. Now two of the three, thank God, are not pregnant. One of them is. Now here's the problem. You see, a consequential conscience will not stop doing something until it pays the consequences. Uh, it's just like the cat and the dog in the house and, and the uh, dog eating the cat's food. And then you come in and holler at the dog and the minute you come in, the dog is smart enough to leave the cat's food because you punished the dog in the past. I don't know that the dog has a conscience, but at least it knows enough not to, in its instinctive ability, it knows enough to stop eating the cat's food because it's going to get uh, disciplined. So consequential conscience, it means that you will not do it when you know you have to pay the consequences, but you will do it if you don't have to pay the consequences. And that's a, that's a sad thing. As long as I don't have to pay the consequences, I will do it, even though it's wrong, and keep on doing it. And I remember when those kids were in this audience preaching up a storm, and those were the nights when you would see me take off on, on sin, and you, you, you by now know when I do that, that I'm trying to help somebody because we love them. And I knew these kids were living wrong, and I knew they weren't right with God, but I had no evidence. So I would spend two or three messages in a row preaching hard against immorality, promiscuity. And you'd hear me say, no touch love, and you may have said, boy, he's saying that a lot lately. That's right. Why was I saying it a lot? Desperately trying to save these kids from immorality and pregnancy. That's why. And with all that preaching that you heard and all the effort that was put into preaching to save them, and to help them, for those three kids, it didn't work. In a way it did, because they called me, and they, they, they knew I loved them, and they knew that I, I would be there for them after they failed, even though I would do everything I could to stop them from failing. But the man in Romans 14, 14, pertaining to things that are not sins, but uh, areas where some people believe you can do it and other people do not believe you can do it. He had a conscience, Paul had a conscience of conviction. And his convictions were absolute convictions. Now, a conscience of conviction, a conviction that he would not use his liberty as an occasion for someone to fall a conviction that he would not use his liberty as an occasion for someone to fall. Number two, a conviction that when he did something, he had faith that it was perfectly all right with Jesus Christ or he wouldn't do it. He had convictions that in itself, because of Jesus Christ, it was clean, and he wasn't going to let a conscience that was conditional by his past or a conscience that lived in the consequential realm, which only acted because of consequences. He was going to act because of conviction. And if it's one thing that ministries like this one, they are endeavoring to do today is to elevate my conscience of conviction to elevate your conscience of conviction. Say, I want God's spirit graciously without disciplining us. Uh, you know, I love Jeremiah, the 10th chapter. And I, it's 23rd, 24th verse, when Jeremiah said, correct me without disciplining me. I, I don't know how many times I've said to the, to the Lord, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But please don't spank me. <laughs> and, and by the way, uh, I'm, I think it's Jeremiah 10. It's been so long since I've looked that verse up, so you, you check that out. It might be, uh, uh, see, the 23 or 24, it seems like it is, 
What? It is 1024. So I'm glad I gave you two because I hit, hit it close by. Basically, what does that verse say, Ruby? Want to read it? Jeremiah, folks, 1024. And if you if you put that over in the Hebrew, it says correct me, but not with any strong discipline. So uh, that's a prayer that you can pray the next time you fail. You remember Jeremiah 1024. First you're inviting God to do it, but you're asking him how what you would prefer him to do. And if the Bible says you call and he will answer, then he will answer you and he will not correct you with strong discipline when he corrects you. So, Paul had a tremendous conscience of conviction, of the grace of God, of the love of God, of his fellowship with Jesus Christ. And he had that kind of a conviction that he didn't have to live constantly with a distorted or troubled conscience. Many people live with a troubled and distorted conscience, and they're always, it's great to examine yourself sometimes, but it's not good to be introspective. I don't know how many people make the mistake of being introspective. You know, if, if you're introspective, you can find something wrong in you, I'll guarantee you. <laughs> Why not just examine yourself, and if there's anything showed to you by the Lord, get it right in a hurry. But why be introspective and live in self-condemnation? And then get highly emotional and live in disapproval of your own self-image and f be frustrated and frustrate the grace of God. So, don't live that way. Learn to live with no condemnation. Learn to live without introspection. Examination in the light of love. Examination in the light of Jeremiah 10.24. Examination in light of scriptures. Examination in the light of growing in grace. But not introspection, which leads to self-condemnation. It is so crucial that we learn consistently to live in the approval of self. Once we're right with God, we can actually approve of ourselves. It's good to approve of yourself and to say, hey, if I, I, while the world stands, I'm not going to offend anybody. I'm not cocky. I'm not... Arrogant, I'm not going to offend anybody. While the world stands, I'm not going to go against Christ by offending you. But by the same time, I will pluck con on the Sabbath of the Pharisees. Jesus did in John 9, 16. He did it deliberately. He plucked con deliberately, and they said he did it on the Sabbath day. Because he did do it on the Sabbath day, and he deliberately tried to offend them. So there's the balance. A false balance is an abomination. A just weight is to delight in God's sight in Proverbs 11.1. 1. And he deliberately did it. I gave that verse many years ago when I led uh, Advent seven-day Advent family. I knocked on the door, and I was determined. Uh, Frank Bad said, you can never win them. He said, Pastor, you've won a lot of people in this area. You will not win those seven-day Advents. And I said, yes, I will. He said, how are you going to win them? I said, I'll win them. We'll pray. We'll go. We'll give the gospel. So I went. Nothing happened. But they did invite me back. That's why they made a mistake. I went back the next week. Nothing happened. Third week, I said, why don't we just study the scriptures and not get into anything controversial, and just study about the Lord Jesus? They said, oh, yes, yes, yes. And by the fourth week, the husband asked the question, why don't you people keep the Sabbath? And I told him, and we had him. He came out to church, got saved. Got, he wasn't even saved in his case. Some of them are, of course, he wasn't. And he got baptized. And Then I said, okay, we're going to win Jehovah Witnesses on uh, 
a tremendous engineer that was an uh, atomic engineer down in uh, uh, Booth Bay Harbor. I said, let's go down and win him. He said, no, I'm Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, I'm the Lord's Witness too. He said, you are? I said, yeah. And, and uh, he said, come in. And I, I said, and we, you know, it was wonderful. He didn't bring up Jehovah's Witnesses at all. Uh, we just talked about things, about the atomic plant and everything he worked at, atomic engineer. Then we kept going back, went back every week, and we won him to Jesus Christ, and his wife was so glad she didn't like Jehovah's Witnesses. They came, got saved, and were baptized. Now, these folks didn't have conscience of conviction, so they wouldn't let me in. See, they didn't have good conscience of conviction. It's a beautiful thing to have a conscience of conviction when you witness. It's a great thing to have a conscience of conviction when you fellowship. It's a beautiful thing to have a conscience of conviction so that right away you express your conviction. You express your conviction. Now, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching. We have every right to offend the self-righteous Pharisees because they're evil and they're hurting people, they're polluting people, and it's great to pluck corn on their Sabbath. All right. Verse 17 here says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not meat and drink. And that's so important. Meat here is brosis, B-R-O-S-I-S. It's from the same root from broma, B-R-O-M-A in verse 15. It means food, really, not meat. While the one here means eating, likewise, the Greek word for drink is posis, P-O-S-I-S. It means drinking. So the correct translation here is eating and drinking in verse 17. Now, the kingdom of God is not a matter of externals or how we dress or how we eat. Now, that's important. That's important. It is righteousness, God's righteousness, peace, made at the cross of Calvary in Colossians 1.20. He is our peace, Ephesians 2.15, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Those who are major on externals, externals are are prone not to show a right spirit or maintain peace. Their lives do not radiate the risen Christ. Now, one of the most sickening things in the world, and you probably have experienced it, and I used to be so repulsive when I first got saved, and I repented, and I shouldn't even bring it up except for an illustration, arguing with everybody. It was horrible because I was a right-wing fundamentalist. I would say, what you, my first question to you, you and I would meet, we'd shake hands. I would say, how do you stand on the Billy Graham issue? <laughs> See, I was soliciting everything about you so I could decide, should I fellowship with you? Wicked Phariseeism. But the people that taught me, unfortunately, taught me to be that way. God had to reteach me, <laughs> redirect the whole teaching process. And then I would say, how do you stand the tongue issue? Meaning, if you spoke in tongues, I wouldn't love you. That's what, that, that was the, behind that question. Do you go so winning? <laughs> oh, it was awful. I'll tell you, the people that are that way, if they were like me, you're not happy as a Christian. Well, I would go down to a ministerium down in Portland, Maine, and there would be 27 pastors, and I was a young pastor, and they would try to get me in their camp. Nazarenes would say, Nazarene pastor, would you come over here and eat with me today, next week, charismatic, next week, Baptist. Baptists are obviously won out in those days. But you see, uh, that ministerium was so phony, they didn't like each other. They didn't respect each other. They would act just as normal as could be. And, and you know what? They never prayed together. We should have turned all those meetings into prayer meetings for the city. 
and for the state of Maine, but they wouldn't pray for one another because there wasn't any love. It was, it was strife, it was sides. I'll tolerate him for the sake of religion. That's, that was the principle. That's an awful way to be. You, you had conditional consciences and not consciences of conviction with the word of God. Well, thank God that the kingdom of God is more than talking. I, when I, I was weak when I first went on the radio. I, the radio broadcast in the early days wasn't good. It's horrible. I'll tell you why. Pastor, what do you think on the tongue issue? Next call, you know, and you go all through that, straighten them people. Next day, same thing, a new person. Pastor, is it right to speak in? You know, you get so sick of hearing that stuff. Who wants to be on the radio? <laughs> Pastor, what do you think of the Sabbath day? You know, every single week, three to five times, the tongues question, the Sabbath question. You know, if the tongues questions come up today, I won't answer it. I'll say, I'll write you a letter. I'm not going to answer it. Why? You've heard me say this, but people are suffering. They're wounded. They're in pain. And they could care less about the tongue issue. They need Jesus Christ. I'm not going to argue for or against something, except for the Bible and the purity of God's life. But I'm not going to get sidetracked on these issues. If a pure, sincere people will call up on the Sabbath day, I once in a while I'll answer the Sabbath question. That's a little different. But the tongue issue, no, sir, I'm not going to answer it. I will send a letter out and show our convictions and send a tape and do it in love. And I get letters every month that down me because I won't straighten the Catholics out. And they run me down, and the letters say, I will not, if, if you don't come clean against the Catholics, I'm not going to listen to the broadcast anymore. I've been listening for years. When that woman called you up the other day and asked about Mary, you were hedging. No, I wasn't hedging either. wasn't hedging at all. But I'm not going to have 250,000 Catholics turn off the radio as I attack something they believe in. And by the way, I'm not going to straighten them out on the radio anyway. Not at all. But I'll tell you what those Catholics like. If, if somebody writes, I'll say, hey, if you write in, I'll show you our convictions. If you want us to send you our convictions, I'll send it to you in mail in 24 hours. That's the way we handle it. But the sad part of it is, why should I offend them when they haven't had a capacity to fall in love with Jesus Christ because perhaps he hasn't present, been presented quite properly to them? So some of you will perhaps be on radio, you'll write books, you'll have television programs, and uh, we were on 380 cable stations for three years. We were on main television stations for 15 years, Channel 8. But we, the whole purpose is to honor and build and exalt Jesus Christ. For the kingdom of God, then, is not those things. It's not arguing doctrine. Having a conviction for the doctrine that you believe and not being wishy-washy, but it's not arguing doctrine. It's not running down people that disagree with you. Because very frankly, what people practice and believe in those things is not an issue with me. It is on Mary, but some of those other things are not issues with me. The issue with me is are we growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and in the personal relationship with the Word of God through the love of God, are we becoming more like him? That's the issue, and you, you, I know you believe that, and I, certainly I believe it. And in verse uh, 18, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Now, therefore, this is really saying, present God's righteousness, present God's peace in the finished work, and present God's joy in your living. And if you do these things, you will serve God acceptably and you will be approved of men. Why? You're not after the approval of men in the wrong sense, but you'll be approved of men. Why? Because you're showing forth the righteousness of God, you're helping people to have the peace of God, and you're living in the joy of the Holy Spirit. So you're approved of men. So that means that you're, you're, you as a messenger 
You're acceptable because you're not argumentative and you're not divisive and you're not bringing up food and drinking as an issue of the gospel. You're bringing up righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And in closing this morning, in case you're new here, I'm saying this only in case you're new. Everybody else has heard it. Now, I understand the argument about the Holy Ghost. This ministry takes the position that you never call the Holy Spirit Holy Ghost. Amen. We say for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, not the Holy Ghost. I understand where they, about the word pneuma and breath and separated unto God's breath, which becomes a living breath and so I understand all the technical technical things but here's why I'm against Holy Ghost because certainly Satan has a wrong connotation pertaining to a ghost I, I don't like to think of God as some ghost <laughs> do you? Oh, who wants God to be a ghost? I got a ghost living inside of me And yet you hear these precious people, and I'm sure they're sincere, and I know they have their academic reasons for saying it. I'm not trying to mistreat them, but you got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. got to be filled. Uh, come forward today to get the Holy Ghost, and Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. They said about 15 times. These people, I don't hang around much on the radio dial when I hear the Holy Ghost crowd. <laughs> Father, dismiss us in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>